Alright guys, hello and welcome to episode 30 of the Crackdown. That's a big one. And for episode 30, we actually got the guy that 3-0'd TSM. You know, I think that it just works okay. out perfectly. And I feel like that's just a great topic to, to jump into with Demonte here first. You just came off this huge victory. I mean, everyone thought that, that you were going to lose. I, I personally had you guys going down 3-1 to TSM. So you guys ended up, you know, cleaning house, man. Quick 3-0 on TSM. How did that feel? Felt pretty good. It felt a lot easier than uh, I expected it to, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Do you think that they like tilted during the ser series? Did you feel them progressively like playing worse and worse as the games went on, or did you feel like it was uh, pretty much the same level the whole time? There was there was definitely something going on, especially game three. Game three was like really really weird when they just started like inting all their macro. It felt like their bot lane was just really tilted or something. And then yeah, for 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 sure, progressively it just got worse for them. Uh, what do you think about that, Thorin? You think uh, doubles was just tilted, or what's your perception on it? I know you've had well, some actually, harsh words. That's that's actually the interesting thing to me is like the, if you look at the series, right? People are going to think because I, I noticed I saw, saw people on Twitter bringing this up, where they were trying to make it like you know when ever Power of Evil's beating Bjergsen because it's happened like two or three times in their careers. People always make it like Power of Evil's the Kryptonite to Bjergsen, which actually might even make sense because he has like an unusual style matchup. But Terry's being different teams. They tried to do it with Demonte because obviously Demonte and Clutch has like a bunch of victories over Bjergsen as well, and they tried to make it like it was that again. But like that's the one narrative that doesn't really work in this match of like listen no offense to Demonte, but your team banned out all of fucking Bjergsen's champions and he still looked pretty good in the series mate so to me the player who should be getting the flame rightfully is double lift and for two reasons one if you look at the way TSM's playing now the reason Broken Blade gets flamed every game it's because they play through fucking mid and bot. So if they're going to play through you, give you the resources, give you the picks, because remember, double lift, if Bjergsen gets five bands, that's zero bands for you. You get whatever champion you want when you're on the right side. And then you're going against two, FBI. Now, here's the thing. This split, I actually think the people in the know would say FBI was actually better than double lift. But the name value is insane on that one. It's like, obviously, all fans are going to think, well, it's double lift, isn't it? So it's like double lift. If you wanted to show everyone you were a good player in TSM, you did the exact opposite. You had everything given to you, and you absolutely shit the bed. Like, you, you got completely outplayed. Like, that was the big... To me, that should be the biggest storyline of that series. It was like, you can get into other stuff, like, obviously, Claws is way better than Spica and all this stuff. But, like, we knew these things going in. Going in, people would not expect FBI in a playoff series to outperform Doublelift. Because I thought Doublelift, that shit the bed for TSM big time this night. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, uh, the, the one thing that was so surprising to me from watching the games would be... Just looking down there and seeing how they just got smashed in every matchup. Kate versus Ash. Like, it doesn't matter what side they got. They're just getting fucking hard bot prioed, like, pushed into the turret. And Double's just clutching onto that shit for dear life down, like, 20 CS. Like, I, I can't believe that that's the Double that we're seeing nowadays. Because double, depressing. Yeah, I mean, Double's just famous for the opposite place, though. I feel like it's even worse that he made the... He, like, backed and TP'd with no item again. And mm -hmm. I feel like this is a mistake you only see out of, like, first-time rookie players. It's like noob page. shit, yeah. Like, it's, so, it's so bad. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it wasn't even... Like, uh, maybe he forgot, like, a couple potions or he forgot, like, a log... No, motherfucker forgot his BF sword. Like, when you're backing <laughs> up 1,300 gold, that is all you're fucking backing for, man. Like, that is the only way you can lane at that point. Dude, and then it's, like, besides for that mistake, I thought it was even worse how he just, like, backed in, like... The, the bush right in front of who he just gets canceled again then has to back even further it was like oh man i can't even watch it anymore so i don't know it, it was a pretty fucking rough series um he was definitely just on tilt or something for yeah, sure yeah so uh, one question i wanted to ask you is like going in did you kind of just perceive it as bjergsen was the only threat on tsm because you guys did ban out all of his like mid lane champions is that was, was that the strategy like tsm can't function if this guy doesn't pop off yeah, pretty much. I mean, we, we played them in week nine of LCS, and it was a pretty close game. The only thing that TSM actually had was just Bjergsen popping off. He kind of like, they, they, they just picked Yumi, and we gave him LeBlanc, because we didn't really think it'd be an issue. And it wasn't even like I had a bad game. It was just Bjergsen was like really carrying super hard. Like, he just had a spectacular game. And then after that, we kind of just realized TSM doesn't really have a, uh, they, they don't really have a, uh, a way to play the game if Bjergsen's not getting ahead and actually carrying so we kind of just went into the games with that mindset where it's like i'm going to neutralize bjergsen and then the rest of our map should be able to play easily because they can't really they don't function if bjergsen like doesn't have prowl or bjergsen's not getting like gold early mm -hmm. do you have a do you have a like certain 
idea of why this is because this is the same thing that we've seen like on multiple different iterations of TSM, right? Like it's pretty much three new players since the last time you played TSM when you were on clutch. And it seemed like it was kind of the same story back then. So like every time you play TSM, it probably feels pretty similar where you're like, oh man, like I just have to like go even with this guy and my team's just going to like smash his. Like, is that just a, you know, a, a Bjergsen problem or do you think that's just a TSM problem? Like how do you perceive TSM as a team? Because I think we see this a lot. Yeah, I think Bjergsen is one of the mini mid laners in the LCS who kind of... If, if, if Bjergsen's on the team, the team's going to be all about Bjergsen. He's kind of the same way where, like, Power Evil is, where if, if these players join the team, they're not going to really... They're not going to move around, I would say, as much, but they're going to force their teammates to all come to them. And I think that play style is, like, arguably a little bit outdated. I feel like if, if you're not, like, getting punished by everyone coming to mid then your the sidelines will kind of collapse and i don't know i think it's just kind of an issue with tsm and like bjergsen's team i don't know if it would change wherever he goes if i'm being honest mm -hmm. doesn't help having spick as a jungle as well because if you see the times he does take picks to try and roam like they're just they're, they're never going to win those games so like at the moment if you're bjergsen you're just stuck between a rock and a hard place it's like at this point in time i would try and just pick for myself and just play for myself like what chance do you have at the moment yeah, well, no, the other carries are functional. I, I think what's so sad is just seeing that game three. Is like, you know, when he locks in set mid in game three, I just knew it was over. I was like, oh man, we're going to see this. It's like, okay, now the pressure is on his teammates to perform and carry. Like, he's going to be the one setting up Spica for this 1v9 Nidalee performance. And then I just, yeah, go I, for it. I don't even know how true it is, though. Like, even when Bjergsen plays these other styles of champions, I feel like he's just not that good at them. So he just doesn't do it because of that. Like, I don't think his teammates are really that bad, if I'm being honest. I think this is like a common thing you see with a lot of mid laners in LCS, where their team looks really bad around them, and then everyone's like, oh my god, this mid laner is so good or something. And like, you, you could even, you could look at a lot of these players and their ADCs always end up sucking. I don't know, like, the FlyQuest AD carries always look bad. I feel like the TSM AD carries never look good. And I feel like those players are not actually bad. It's just that their mid laners are just playing way too greedy. You know what? He's got a point there, Dom. I've actually never thought of that because here's the issue, right? Is if something happens like once, fair enough. In fact, there's actually a famous quote that's like that. It's like once is a you know an, an accident, two is coincidence, three times is enemy action. As in, if someone does like something fucked to you three times, like they did it intentionally at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Like think about this, right? Think about the last three AD carries that Bjergsen has had. Sven, right? When Sven was playing with Bjergsen. Sven looked absolute trash. After that, everyone said he was the MVP. Then he had Kobe. Kobe came from being hailed, not by me, but by the broadcasters, like all pro best fucking AD carry in Europe. Absolute garbage on TSM. Now he gets Doublelift back, who at least, to be fair, had been bad on TL. So that's not quite like the same scenario. It's not like he was great before Do Bjergsen, but he's not good now either. So like, even though I think actually in the split he had, there was times where he was decent at least. It is, there is something disturbing about that. Like, if I think about it, except for when Doublelift was in his prime in TSM, I don't think Bjergsen's ever actually played with a super strong AD carry for my money. Like, it does it does almost feel like the whole team just always resolves around Bjergsen, which, face it, is TSM. Like, their fans just use that approach, where even though before the game they love everyone, afterwards it's like, right, how can I blame everyone except Bjergsen? So if you never blame the one guy who's in the team all the time, there's going to be something like that. Because the point isn't that Bjergsen is a bad player. We're talking now about how do you interact with your teammates, aren't we? Yeah, I mean... I just, how do you set the game up? I think for me, it's just so egregious how his teammates are playing that I can't, like, even even though I, I do think that there's something there, I don't think Bjergsen is, like, the same player as he was in Season 5 compared to the rest of the league or anything. Oh, of course. But, like, when I'm looking at, at Golden Guardians, for example... I don't think you should be allowed to early pick Morgana support every fucking game and never get counterpicked in the in all these lanes. Like, how are you supposed to play Ash Morgana if the enemy team just picks Karma or something? Like, there's so many picks that just take Morgana and bend it over in the fucking lane phase. And that's why we don't see this pick early early picked, you know? But if you're going to be the type of team like TSM is where it's like, oh, you have Morgana? Nice. Let me just counterpick myself. Put Thresh in. You put Treats in there. He's missing every fucking hook the entire game anyway. It's like... How the fuck are you, like, like you're not even setting your team up for, for success. So, like, I, I don't even know, like, how you can even talk about that. Because I feel like, sure, you can blame coaches and stuff for the draft. But at some point, as a player, you have to know your fucking lane matchups and be like, hey, they just did this. We will win you the fucking game. Draft us Karma Kate right now. We are going to dry hump their turret, be up, like, 50 CS, lane kingdom. Turret's going to be down eight minutes. We're going to swap, control Herald, and just take over the entire game. Like, you have to have that confidence at some point. I feel like it was just a lot of preparation gap, if I'm being honest, because our, our bot lane basically just told us they, they wanted to like test treats because treats is like first time playing LCS, right? So 
They just said like maybe the like first first game we're just gonna go try like blind pig Morgana and maybe they won't have an answer. We even saw like in his solo queue, he was playing like Zyra and these like Morgana <laughs> counters, but like <laughs> As soon as we locked in Morgana and then he pulled out Thresh, everyone kind of was like, wow, like, okay, I guess this is how this is going to go. Yeah. Dude, you know what kills me about that That's is good. when you say you looked at his solo queue, you just mean you looked at like OP.GG or something, right? And checked out yeah. what he's playing, I assume. Exactly. So the dumbest thing about that, by the way, is bearing in mind he's not playing in pro games in solo queue. He's just playing against fucking streamers. Why not just play all the champions so they can't do like five minutes research like that? Like, that's like that shit back in the day where everyone made fun, actually, I've referenced it earlier, Power of Evil. When the first time he beat Bjergsen at the IEM, dude, Loco Doco, no joke, didn't even do a five minute OP.GG search because they just gave him like fucking Syndra and shit at the time was like power of evils like he had like two things he played and they just gave him both those picks like so in that scenario it's like why didn't treats just play all the champions just in solo because you can't at least just do that it's one thing you know if they went and watched the game and saw you're not actually competent all he has to do is it just like yes to just duo with a good adc and just show he has a victory and they're gonna go all right it seems like he plays it so i guess that doesn't work like these guys beat these guys are using websites to fucking beat you tsm <laughs> motherfuckers who make guides that's all you make money off is doing guides to the game yeah, I mean, to me, though, I, yeah, I well, just... Maybe that's the move, TSM. If you can't play the champions, just do a guide as to how to beat your bot lane and just put, say, all the champion cameras. At least you make money. You make money either way, right, Reggie? I just think that that's so... <laughs> like, I feel like that shouldn't work, you know? It shouldn't, of course. Like, Come on. Uh, going into, like, a professional best of five, you really can't play any of, of the Morgana counters. It's not like one champion counters Morgana. It's not like, oh, like... Morgana is only countered by AP Cosmo bot lane support with the Spell Thieves and, like, Aerie. It's, it's not some shit like that. It's like, hey, man, all the Enchanter supports, literally all of them, counter Morgana, and you can't play any of them? Like, what the fuck is that? Like, how, how do you not have one answer that you found out of all of that? Sure, if you don't like Karma for some reason, play something else, man. I'm sure, uh, like, play Nami or something. That still is a fucking good lane phase. Please, play anything else in the fucking game besides for these, like, you know, like, two champions i don't know it just doesn't seem like something that should be a, a counter because like you should be more versatile th in, than that in like every single role it's like a, a, a jungler not being able to play one tank champion it's like you can't play like sejuani or volibear or set or, or anything like there's not one pick out of that whole like archetype you can play seems so weird to me also, I'm just going to throw this out there. Again, just like I said with the Bjergsen doublelift thing, like if you're double if you should feel twice as bad since all the bands went to Bjergsen. Like in that scenario, you have to carry me. Here's another scenario. If you're treats and you don't have any of the lane counters and you don't play any of them, how about just be responsible and say to your team, like, I think this is a game where we're weak side and put Broken Blade on fucking carries instead of just putting Broken Blade out there to just get wrecked and then you just don't even do anything in your lane. Like when I look at this series here, Dom, so Broken Blade, first game, Shen, Awesome. Wonder what that's for. Oh, so you also had a shield as well, double lift, and you still fucking lost. Brilliant. Like this, and then second game, he plays on. Fair enough. Everyone can in theory play on. Third game, he plays Gangplank, which is like that's almost like they were just punishing TSM fans at that point in time. It's like, why, why is why is double lift get everything and broken blades out there? Like, can anyone spare two dimes? He's like fucking veteran or something in the US Army. Like, anyone care about me anymore? Nah, no one gives a fuck, mate. <laughs> I mean, also our bans were also like towards Broken Blade a bit. We were banning like the flex picks, especially like Aurelia and Akali. It's like stuff that Broken Blades always look super comfortable on. Sure. So definitely he wasn't super enabled either. Yeah. I, I think that that was the thing. But um, yeah, just like as somebody watching the games, like if you've watched every TSM game, you know when the gangplank's locked in that it's just fucking doomed. Like that oh. is always the pick they lose on. For some reason, like I don't even think he plays it like that bad. I think he has some problems with like barrel placement um, in lane, but I don't think he's like the worst gangplank in the world or like, enable, like unable to win lane on it or something like that. I just think that it's not like there, there's a difference between a uh gangplank coming out of him and then you know a gangplank coming impact out of some yeah like someday or impact or somebody that actually plays the champion so, but whenever that's locked in as a tsm fan your, your heart just must just it, sink it? all the way to the floor because you know that that's just going to be like the, the the game where it's like all right guys like just keep on scaling like i almost have my third item here and and it, when you get the third item like the fucking base is destroyed enemy team is, has soul and shit and they just go for like one team fight and lose the game but i mean just in general watching the series i just felt like i felt like the the soul leaders just don't they're not they're not actually set up for victory if their bot lane is not going to be able to um ever get pressure because i feel like bot pride is just such a core part of the game right now i don't know how, how you feel about it demonte but from watching like other regions it seems like the whole reason why people play so much caitlin so much ash is because dragon soul is 
just how you win the game. And like whoever gets soul first, whoever's stacking the most dragons normally is the team that has like the pressure throughout the game. So um, just drafting prior bottom, being able to like push the enemy bot lane and get dragon, etc. That's normally like a huge win condition. Yeah, I think every, every I feel like every time the season comes to an end, like summer, everyone just goes back to the same stuff where both bot lanes are trying to pick for prior and just to push that way they can get the dragons and swap to Herald first. It's like, I don't know, bot, bot lane is just too broken, if I'm being honest. It's just, yeah, there's two agree. people instead of one, so it just moves around. And if, if your bot lane's winning, then you just like win macro for all of early game. Yep, 100% agree on that. Do you guys, uh, did you guys make like the conscious decision to like, you know, have FBI like enabled into like a more aggressive style this split? Because it seems like this guy is like playing for Pryo all the time, and that was like always his biggest strength. So did you guys like consciously like decide to play more through FBI um, this split or anything like that? Um, I don't think it was like a thing where we sat down and we were like, yo, let's like, let's enable FBI more. I think it's something that just like when I got brought onto the team, I just mm -hmm. brought a different like style into the mid lane, I guess that like helps him more. Cause I, th I think he, what, what like the way Golden Glue plays is like, he, he reminds me of the mid laners like Bjergsen and Power People who like, yeah, just not as good. They, yeah, they just demand a lot, but they don't actually like, like Golden Glue doesn't carry as hard as those players. So like when I came on the team, and I wasn't like requiring closer and who he to come and help me base or like I'm not requiring to play Azir or these champions that don't move. It kind of just like made it so our bot lane could shine more, I think. And yeah, I mean, FBI, I think, has been at this level the whole time. I think maybe he's he's also gotten like a lot more used to playing like the pro matches, I would say. I think when I first joined, I thought he would be he was a little nervous when the stage games came around. But now I feel like he's kind of finding his place more. Yeah. Might have something to do from playing from the comfort of his own room, but uh, who knows? True. But uh, I mean, that's one thing that, that I think that, that FBI has gotten a lot better on that, that I think you reference is just like, he, it felt like in clutch moments, he would always have like one or two big deaths and then like the game would just snowball. But it seems like he's kind of eliminated that. He kind of reminds me of like Cody's son earlier on in his career where he Some would just have, yeah. yeah, where he said like where he would, he would be like really strong and then he would just int one time and as an 80 carry, you int one time bad enough, like the game's just over. Awesome. And, it seems and like, it's the most memorable part of the game. You just yeah. remember the guy who was in the team fight and you think exactly. it's all his fault. Yeah. It seems like FBI is like kind of shored up that weakness for the most part. It doesn't seem like he's losing Golden Guardians. Uh, games really and you know i mean Hanser's like been used to playing weak side for his entire career so of course honestly i think i think uh golden guardians has uh it sounds pretty good formula. yeah yeah it's pretty sweet there's another area you can contrast tsm like we're talking about a team in golden guardians which when back when they had golden glue people thought this was going to be like the worst team in the league yeah, remember tenth. because obviously if people forget coming into the season i know it sounds ridiculous now but Teams like Dignitas and CLG actually look like they had pieces. It's just they don't now. So as a result, right, you look at the team, all of a sudden, almost every piece, like even Hui, I'll give him credit, looks a lot better now than he did it earlier, in this, even in this split. Like even he's getting it together. So you look at the setup. This is a team that knows how to draft and what their identity is. Then you go and look at TSM. By the way, a team with more wins than them. They look like they have no idea how they even want to play the game themselves. Even when their draft almost screams like the only way we can play is through these lanes. Like even like it's amazing to me that like one like like GGS coaching staff must have done a great job, right, Demonte? Yeah, I mean for sure. I think Anero was a big uh, advocate for getting me in the in like the off season. I think he kind of realized that what I would bring would be pretty good for the team. I also I also think like. I don't, I don't know how to phrase this, but like in, in the playoff series, I basically played three mages that are all very greedy. And we also just kind of won playing that style as well. So it kind of felt, it felt, it felt good to like make sure these other teams in playoffs know that we're not super one dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, by the way, that's another thing as well, Dom. It's like, if we're saying Bjergsen is the star player, which obviously is in TSM, like, Good luck 1v9ing the game when you're playing a Zay versus Ziggs matchup. Like, yeah. <laughs> so let me see all those kills in lane. What the fuck's that? Like, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's a good strategy, right? I mean, if, 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 if you're going into the game, like Demonte said, you're trying to neutralize Bjergsen, yeah, hit him sure. with all those weird picks. That must Why be the not? most, yeah. like, frustrating. Like, I, I know that, that, you know, Bjergsen must just be sitting there the whole time, like, God, this guy is playing like such, such a bitch, man. Like, he won't, he won't even walk up. Like, what the fuck's going on? Like, he, he must just be sitting there the whole time, just, Looking for an angle, it's like, all right, maybe can we, can we do dragon? Can we roam? Looks bot lane, sees like them down like 50 CS, like no BF sword TPing back to lane. It's like, okay, never <laughs> mind, we can't fucking roam. All right, just uh, I, I guess we we just go late, guys. Like Azir's really strong late game, right? Not it's a fucking Ziggs, it's not. So I mean, it's funny to see like the Ziggs counter pick though, because for me, like the counter pick that I see to Azir in that same like 
idea um, is normally Kogma. Like people play a lot of like AP Cog in other regions. Like LEC loves AP Cog into Azir. Is there any reason you guys went for the Zig specifically? Because it doesn't seem like it's really in uh, meta that much. I think I mean Ziggs has been buffed like four or five times over the last couple of years, and it's just like a pocket pick that I've always had. That I don't know, it, especially when ADCs are in the meta that aren't mobile, it's like really easy to just make them useless. I would say so now like Caitlyn and Ash and even Aphelios when it pops up are just still like getting played a lot. If you just throw, if you're level 16, you throw Ziggs ults at them, they're gonna lose their entire health bar and not really be able to fight it. There's like one team fight. There, I mean, honestly, there were a bunch of team fights, but there's one team fight in particular where we were just in mid lane. And Doublelift walked up to me to try to like auto attack me. I just ulted him and auto attacked him, and he was at like five percent HP. I just do at that point. I was just like, this champion is just too OP. Yeah. The problem is, I actually think Ziggs is one of those champions where like it, it could be played more, but it has the same stigma as like Malzahar, where it's like if you win on it, people are like, that doesn't count. That that, that champion is bullshit. So like, no one, it's not cool to win on those champions. It is in your case because you're trying to like actually be. There's TS, no way it's the cool. team. Right? No, I don't think it's think, the same at I all. I think it has a stigma, though. Because think of like, some of the famous Ziggs players, like fucking yeah. Jezis or Easy, who no one respects these players, mate. Like, they think, that's why I contrasted <laughs> to Malvaha. Like, dude, Crown won Worlds, and everyone was like, you know what, Crown, you're shit. He's like, dude, I just won Worlds. They're like, yeah, on Malvaha. He's like, can't, I can't get no respect. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take the world's win no matter what I play, you know? Like, <laughs> one, maybe that might be worth it. I feel like the trade-off was good for that one, Crown. You did a good one on that one. Check his bank account real quick, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess one thing we should, we should definitely uh, talk to you about, which has been discussed in the community pretty heavily over the last week, is, like, the whole Jensen versus Bjergsen debate. Uh, you just played against Bjergsen. Like, do you have a, an interpretation of, like, who's better or, like, who you prefer to play into out of those two players? Like, what do you think is, like, really the difference between them? Because... Yeah, we've just been hearing a lot of uh, Bjergsen apologists come out and just say that this guy is, uh, you know, significantly better than Jensen. So what's your take on it? I mean, in my opinion, I think Jensen is probably the, like, the only world-class mid laner in the LCS. I think he kind of just, he, he doesn't make the same mistakes that a lot of the other mid laners make where they, they guys said earlier, they pull their team to them a lot. Like Jensen doesn't require a lot of resources to pop off. And I think that's really valuable, especially in his team where he has so many players who are actually just so smart where he will just play his lane really well. And then as soon as Cordy J has like one timer, it just he just wins the mid lane for Jensen. And Jensen just does his job every game super consistently. Also, he plays like he plays side lane really, really well. It's something that a lot of mid laners don't do. They'll force their ADCs to go side lane. And Jensen is not really that type of player. He'll just play the side lane and he'll do his job really well. And yeah, I mean, I think Jensen is better than Bjergsen. I don't know if it's an extremely huge margin, but I definitely think Jensen's the best millionaire right now. Makes sense. Got any opinion on that, Thorne? Uh, I just think that, like, because as usual, we all know people on Reddit and generally in the community. The problem is they start forming the opinion when they see the title of the content before they've even watched it. So you never know who's actually watched the content. So if people don't know, even though I also agree with DeMonte, like for many of the reasons he even says, like, I think Jensen's also probably the most self-sufficient mid laner while also being a star and a fucking carry and on the best. Team. Like, he's got a million factors and he's got Broxer as his jungler. Like, to be fair, yeah, Jensen has his bad. Uh, but not like Bjergsen has a good jungler either, but... Like put it, it puts him yeah. above like the Niskis of the world in yeah. that scenario. So, Demonte, like, you lucked out. Let's just say that real quick. He did. Yeah, yeah. He got a pretty nice jungle. Let's be real. Yeah. But yeah. no, like my take on it is like I, here's the thing. I personally do think in the same way as I actually also have Larson over Caps in Europe. I think like I do have a pick of for who the best is. But I don't hate it if you go with the other guy. Like if you think Caps is the best mid in Europe, I'm fine with that. If you think Bjergsen is the best mid in NA, I can see reasons why you could say that. But one of the points I made in my video, the video was really more about how people characterize Jensen. Like, when he's on top, he can't get his prime. When he wasn't the one on top, everyone just said, well, the fact you're not on top means you're not the best. So it's like, how does that work? When does Bjergsen ever get the same credit? When does the same criteria that went against Jensen ever go against Bjergsen? The answer is never, because it's TSM fans that make the rules up. So as a result, you know what? I've been told this my entire career when I've been arguing for these players. So when I've argued Froggen versus Xpeke and Jensen versus Bjergsen, I was always told, Dom, that when I say, because that's what used to be one of my arguments for Jensen and Froggen, it's like, well, look at their teammates. Like, they, they have the worst teammates. And so if they're close, if anything, you can make a case they're as good or better. Everyone would always tell me, Dom, ah, but that's another reason why Xpeke and Bjergsen out. are amazing. Because they're so, um, such great guys and such great teammates. Yeah, they, you know, they improve and they motivate their teammates and they attract great teammates. It's like, all right, well then that logic by the same logic you now have to say it's Bjergsen's fault that his teammates are shit that's the same logic 
That is exactly <laughs> consistent. Like, how can you then go? Well, I, by the way, I would agree with you if you just said Bjergsen's like on his own in TSM and he's fought. I would agree with that. But you can't use that if you've argued against that position in the past. So if you're a TSM fan, it's your own fault for, for literally sounding like, like when they start talking like that, by the way, about things they can't possibly know, that like expect him, Bjergsen, like they, they're like seeing a movie in their mind of like him coming in, like, it's all right, kid, stick with it. Maybe you'll make it in this game. You're, you're just like fangirls at that point in time. Like it sounds like, you, it sounds like you're talking about who's your favorite member of like a fucking boy band and you're a 14 year old girl. Like, can you grow up please guys? Yeah, no, I mean that, that literally <laughs> comes, comes down to like the fans being like, but I saw this video of Expeke like dancing around in his underwear with his like crotch, like stuffed with a bunch of socks and like him and Cyanide joking around about it. Like you could tell that that was the moment where Cyanide felt motivated. To awesome. Great. Uh, shout out to, uh, you you were just saying something like that Jensen has to win like the next four championships or something. I think that's about, I'm assuming that's where it caught. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's where it died. I think we got the joke in. We got the uh, the stuffing Xpeke's underwear joke in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we're good. Okay. Anyways, the editors are going to save us on that one. Thank you for sticking with us, uh, chat. But yeah, I mean, the, the gist of what we were talking about there was just that there's no way for Jensen to actually ever win in, in this in this debate, even if TL goes on. Um, to win multiple championships, no one will really care um, going forward about that. So, um, Dude, yeah. the way you know that's true is like, look how they had to, because obviously this split, you'd have a hard time arguing against Jensen being a really good player, right? So what was the angle they took this split? Now they started doing mad shit, like psychologically analyzing the guy, like, oh, he's a bit bitter and salty the way he said that. Like, well, these are the reasons to hit on a guy now. What the fuck is this? Because that's the problem I have, Dom, is like anyone who's an actual pro player in the LCS, or I would consider like a, a reasonable analyst, not like some hater who just only likes one person and hates the other one. What they'd say is Jensen versus Bjorks is an awesome rivalry. In the same way as, by the way, Frog and Xpeke was an awesome rivalry. Like there's different reasons you can think one's better than the other. The different ones have, yeah, one has more success than the other. But even then, it's not like they both have... It's only one has success. No, they have different levels of success. I mean, the Jensen Bjergsen one's even better because Jensen had the more international success and Bjergsen had the more domestic success. It's actually like that classic fucking NFL quarterback one of like Peyton Manning versus Tom Brady. Yeah, Tom Brady has all the Super Bowls. Peyton Manning has all the MVPs and all the regular season shit. So it's like, it's actually a great dynamic. But the problem is, this is always happens. Bad fans take a brilliant rivalry and they just present it as though, as though it was like, like I said, they presented it as though it was like Bjergsen's faker and the other guy's like fucking golden glue. They make it seem like the, like the gap is enormous. Like the gap is not, like the whole point is no matter what you think, the gap's like that, isn't it? Most of the time it's tiny. Yep. It's just preference basically. Definitely. So don't ruin fucking sick rivalries, you idiots. Because I'll tell you what, and this is a, I, I realize no one will ever heed these words because it's years down the line. But if you were a fan of Frogger versus Xpeke back in the day, don't you miss them now? Don't you miss that rivalry? Whether you like Xpeke more than Froggen, I bet you I bet you wish they were playing, not like in the current level, but at their primes, I bet you wish you could watch that again. Because what's funny is if you ever go on YouTube now and you look up videos for like old school rivalries, you often see loads of YouTube comments of like, oh, I used to hit this guy, but now he's gone. Like I'm like Kobe or something. Like, oh, I miss watching him play. He was so sick against my teams. Like you should respect greatness even if you don't like the guy. Yeah. How, how was that rivalry? I don't I don't think I... Froggen Xpeke? Really yeah. Well, the funny thing is, actually, at the time, it was like a really distinct playing style difference as well, yep. because Xpeke was like the monster assassin player, whereas Foggen was like the best mage player. And then as a result, actually, the way people usually decided it is, as usual at the time, Fnatic were winning the championships, so they said Xpeke had to be better. And to be fair, especially because he was an assassin player, obviously Xpeke used to roam lords and go for like kills around the map, whereas Foggen used to just try and get the CS lead and win the team fight, which is like... Let's face it, it's not like he's changed now, as he saw. That was like that's why it was also a good matchup, by the way, because that one was cool because it was like such like a, a contrasting matchup. It was like, what do you prefer in style? How do you think of these styles? Whereas actually the other thing about the Jensen Bjergsen one that kills me, dude, is like I don't want to hear any of these stories from like seven years ago that Bjergsen's an assassin player. He isn't. They're both fucking mage players. Like, both of them are just going to play Oriana and just get a CS lane. Like, what is this shit? And they're both going to stay in lane and just do awesome job. Like, that's why it's such a stupid, like contrast that they're like so different like this to me they're like so similar as players like i said it's preference it's what what your criteria is do you like yeah what i, what I like is that uh your your criteria has stayed the same because you're still like a larson guy over a cats oh. guy because like that's yeah. just the, that's the style that, that you prefer you to like you want to see like the massive like cs leads into like smashing team fights like that's what you value as a mid laner whereas like for me I, i'm always more on like the like rome side i'm always more on the do and b side where it's like, I want to see like this motherfucker out of lane level three diving so, some guy. Because I'm a jungler, you know, I love that shit. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. If my mid laner's like showing up to dive level three, I'm like, oh man, this guy's good. Get him in L6. 
LCS, you know, like I'm going to sing his praises on all of my talk shows. So, um, yeah, it just, it just depends on what you like. So one thing that we got to talk to DeMonte about, uh, I think it's great to do this conversation with, with Thorne here, um, is the whole fact that he spent a whole split behind Froggen. Froggen obviously got benched um, this split. Uh, I think there was 0-6 on, on Dink Tots. He got benched. Um, Phoenix came in over that. And, uh, you know, more than just the Froggen thing, there was a bunch of mid laners that didn't look good. There were imports starting over DeMonte. We had Aika, we had Ryoma. Um, yeah, and then Yaika and Gohoma, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yaika and, Ga- and Gohoma. They were both, um, <laughs> they were both playing, uh, LCS. I've never heard that. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> I came up with it myself. You know. <laughs> Listen, if Twitch is going to say stupid shit, I'll just do a better version of it. So there you go. Yeah, perfect. There's, there's a new, new pog champ or whatever. So, so what was your interpretation of this whole situation, uh, you know, coming, uh, going to Worlds and then coming home and, you know, you're uh, way, in an academy? Dom, I've got a, a point we should bring up before we discuss this exact topic. Because okay, what, sure. Dom, Dom, wasn't it when you were on Summoning Insight, I think it was you who told us this. Didn't you tell us that mad detail? That like Froggen has it in his contract that he had to start or something. That's why you couldn't. Wasn't it something? Was it you who told us that? I think it was Don. Was, I, did you say that? I, I I said that on face check, which I can oh, like. I must a, have seen a clip of it now or something. Yeah, like. but, it is a very confirmable <laughs> detail. The detail is, is crazy if true, because if people don't know, that meant that, yeah, in theory, Froggen like, in his contract, he had to be the starter, which I think is a mad toxic detail to have in a contract. But I mean, yeah. I guess he just uses leverage or something. But is, is, was that true? But did you hear something like that? I mean, I've heard the rumors. I don't really know if if it's like 100% true or anything. Obviously, for summer, it didn't. It wasn't true, right? They they started Phoenix, but mm-hmm. like, it was definitely not something I was informed of before I signed my contract for 2020. Yeah, I mean, so uh, they, like that's something that if if I was told that, then I probably wouldn't have gone there. Yeah, it sucks. You can't win I, your spot, can you? Exactly. Yeah, like my my idea was okay. Kind of sucks. I got put in academy, but like I want to play behind someone that I think I can replace. You know. How are you able to, like, I mean, humble yourself and, like, get through Academy? Because, like, I, I, we've seen a lot of players, like, have that just completely mental boom them where they feel like they're, you know, the qual- their LCS caliber and then they're just stuck in this, like, Dark league. Dark, million players, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it helps that I was playing with a lot of my friends, I would say. In Academy, I'm playing, like, with Lorlo and Acadian. Those are two people that I'm pretty close to. So, it kind of, it, it was, like... It wasn't like every day I came into to the scrims and I was not having fun. I was still having a good time every day at least. So that that helped a lot. And I don't know. I just I had this drive where I, after I went to Worlds, I really felt like I got so much better. And then I didn't want to let it all go to waste. I would say like I definitely wanted at least one more shot in the LCS to see how I stacked up. You know, after I got the experience that I did. Mm-hmm. Dude, did fucking uh, Acadian, like, he's another of those, like, insanely unlucky players. The way, like, the, the zigs when he should have zagged in his career every time are brutal. Like, did this guy have some sort of cursed monkey paw scenario? Did he just find, like, the magical monkey paw? And he was like, right, first of all, I'd like to be a starting mid laner in a bunch of splits. It's like, it's like, well, we never said you wouldn't get replaced by Grig halfway through. And then the other oh, one's yeah. like, and I want I want to play for, I want to make it out of Academy into the LCS. It's like, didn't say you'd be going back again, bitch. It's like, yes, it's your, your, it's whole career. Like, this guy's in purgatory. It's so mad. And what I don't understand is, why do people, here's the thing, I get the idea that people, for whatever reason, a coach doesn't think he's good enough or he has some bad games or slumps or whatever. But why do they, why do these players always get, like, the chance again, but then people take it away from them? Because what's weird about that is it implies when you give them the chance that you believe in them and then you just also, like, instantly turn on them. That's what I don't get about those moves. Same with Golden Glue. Like, people sign him as a starter and then fire him halfway through the split. It's like, who did he think he was signing? Like, did he think he was signing Faker or something? Would it? Surely, if you're surely if you're in on the Golden Glue ride or the Arcadian ride, stick with it, work with it. You know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't really speak for what happened with Arcadian because when he played on the Dignitas House main team, I wasn't playing there, so fair enough. I, I didn't really get to see firsthand what happened. But I feel like a lot of the teams and like coaches don't want to sign the rookie players because they think it's going to be too much of a gap early on, which I think is like kind of a wrong mindset. I think you should kind of want that instead of signing like some of the like players who get uh like recycled i would say i think oh so you mean like, like they're, they're signing the, someone like golden glue because they think right well he can do this basic thing and i'll warm the rookie up and then replace him when he's ready or something like that um maybe not so much like warming the rookie up but they just don't they, they want the skill floor to be higher i think like i, right. I don't think they want to just coin flip on be like okay, okay what, what if this new player that we're gonna put in just can't actually stand up to the competition at yeah, all sure mm-hmm. yeah i mean I, I i i can see that but i mean 
what's weird to me about players like that is like how do you not figure out how to be resourceful at some point because even even for example last year with you right like when it became obvious that you're like okay i'm not gonna match up like on control mages to like jensen etc i'm gonna fucking play a different style so that i have an advantage and i'm able to win like you were able to like bring out kiana and you're playing um you're just playing like more like roam mids and you're trying to like help your team more and like things like that uh, what i don't understand is how players can never find any adaptation like how can you not find anything that you do better than these players to be useful like that just seems like like a complete waste like for example like ryomo right we're, we're he's supposed to be one of these cha these uh guys that is versatile on a bunch of different champions right he's supposed to be like this yasuo player things like that um but we never saw one time right like there's there's never a point where he can like try to use his skill set to um like get an advantage over the competition is he just really that useless of a player i don't know i i, I don't buy it I, I don't know if it's coaching staff or what yeah, I don't know what happens there because even I've played versus Ryoma's uh, Yasuo in solo queue and his like assassins. They're pretty, they're pretty clean. Honestly, they're pretty good. But they didn't. He he, did, he just played Zoe and Azir the whole split. So yeah, he definitely didn't get to showcase himself. I feel. What do you think about that angle Dom was like setting up with the characterization there? Because like from the outside, it looks as though one of the things you've done in your career, whether consciously or the coaches or whatever, like one of your strengths has been working with good junglers, right? When you had Lyra, now you've had Klausa, like you, you've done a really good job in like enabling those guys, work with them. Maybe they enable you. Like, what, what would you say about that? Um, I mean, for, for Lyra, I think he's like the most criminally underrated jungler of like all time and NA, maybe not all time, but he's so underrated. I, th he taught me so much about the game just in general, just like he has like a very Korean mindset of like ebb and flow where if one person gets an advantage, it's his duty to kind of like spread it to the rest of the team. And that's sure. something that I feel like that gave me an advantage over so many people in NA, even the star players, because they don't really do that. They I've touched on it already once or twice in the show, but like anytime I get an advantage, I feel like it's my job to now help my team. And that's kind of something that I'm trying to put on the whole Golden Guardians team, just like trying to teach them that if you if you're able to get a lead and you're able to pressure the entire map rather than just your lane, then it just makes the game really easy to play. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I guess if we're, if we're talking about that roster and other player that I, I definitely want to get your opinion on is Huni. Obviously, Huni, um, you know, has been the recipient of a lot of criticism. I've criticized him a fair amount because I personally just feel like his lane phase and everything, it just looks like he's trolling half the games to me. Um, but everyone that's played with him has always said good things. So, like, what was your interpretation of, of Huni? Like, do you think that he's being underrated right now? I know a lot of people are, you know, flaming, like, some of the choices that he makes in-game. Like, do you think that he's, uh, you know, somebody who's... Uh, one of the things that we heard from Vulcan, who was on the show as well, was that he's the type of player where if his team is really uh, good, he can do more. But um, when he's with one of these teams that is struggling or, you know, he doesn't feel the confidence of his teammates, he'll just take more of like a, a, a role in the game. Like he'll just try to flip the game more because he feels he's like he's trying really to force carry. the game. And yeah. yeah, exactly. What's yeah. your interpretation? I think Huni is the kind of player where when he tries and cares about winning, that he can make the team really, really good. Like on Clutch Gaming, I in Spring Split, we finished ninth place, right? And during that split, I didn't feel like Huni really cared. But in Summer, it felt like he cared so much and he kind of, he took he took like this role on the team where he was teaching everyone a lot and he was just controlling a lot of the macro. And then for, for 2020, I don't know, I, I watched him play in Academy and I was really surprised when they put him into the LCS team, if I'm being honest, because he, he didn't was running look, it. yeah, he, he looked kind of, like a clown for sometimes in academy so i was surprised that he played especially because i don't know i thought jizuke was okay he, jizuke started flipping a lot of the games too and kind of running it but i thought this guy was one of the best mid laners for sure when he was like having his good games i thought he was better than i mean i think he got first or, was he second team se all pro in spring i think second team yeah, yeah like he was pretty pretty damn good and then i don't know they, they put in huni and they I think they lost more games with Huni than they did with Jizuke yep. and Kumo. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. definitely, definitely feels bad to be like Kumo and Jizuke, but for for Huni, I don't know. When he when he wants to win, I feel like he can do it. And by the way, since on the last episode we had Jensen, and obviously he touched on that whole Swole Bros thing where like Reaper was doing most ridiculous shit in the finals, like putting Golden Glue in. All I'm gonna say is this is where, like, listen, I've I've had to say this a million times. You are aware, right? It's fun to have narratives, but this isn't WWE. This isn't like a fake TV show where we can just decide, like, oh well, I like I like like for example, Demonte is one of the only players who actually has like a catchphrase, right? So we'll just make him the best mid from now on then. Every single time he's playing, it's Tana time, <laughs> and like we'll do a whole segment. No, because the problem is 
always it doesn't make sense to do that until he is the best mid. Like that's when it would be appropriate. So like everyone who like mad overplayed that whole like Swole Bros thing. Are you enjoying that? Did you enjoy this split of the Swole Bros? Were the Swole Bros in good form, were they? No. They looked like they got the wrong fucking whatever, turbinol or whatever the shit they injected. <laughs> that's obviously a joke, by the way. I'm not actually accusing them of put, injecting steroids. I'm just saying that, they're, <laughs> listen, all I'm going to say is how do you put that many solo queue hours in and still, you know, I don't know about that. Arnold Schwarzenegger had a few sayings back in the day. But no, the point is it was garbage, wasn't it? That narrative was just nothing. Because even though I sort of got what they were trying to do stylistically with the change there, like, I think it was a mixture they wanted to try Hooney because Kuma wasn't that good. But it was also, yeah, they obviously didn't weren't able to play Jizuke's style. The problem is I actually feel really torn about that at the end because generally I hate global meta thinking like that. And the way it ended, I don't think they got enough out of that swap. Like when I look at that swap at the end, Hooney wasn't able to hard carry the games because like, let's face it, he's top laner as well. Like doesn't really hard carry games at the moment. And Golden Glue... Like, everyone was playing majors now, so actually didn't even have, like, a niche. So, to me, I think they should have just gambled and stuck with Jizuke. Because, as you say, when he would pop off, he would still be amazing. He could still be one of the best players. Yeah, I mean, I also just believe that... that so, the, the angle there is... Who has the bigger advantage over the NA player, right? It's like, which yes. import is better than these shitty NA players that we have, right? Because everyone just hates NA players at this point. So, it's like, is do you want Jizuke on your team? Or over Golden Glue, is that gap bigger than Huni over Kumo? Um, and for me, I don't even know if Huni's better than Kumo right now. Like, from watching the games, I feel like if you're going to have some guy playing top lane, playing Shen, Renekton, Orn, these champions, I would rather have Kumo than 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 Huni every time. Like, it doesn't feel like that's his strength. Like, I feel like you put Huni in so that he can play the, the things that we saw him trying to play, the, the Camilles of the world. Etc. Like Aurelia. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aurelia. Whatever carry top top you want. I think we saw like a Kennen game in here where he built like Gunblade with like 380 carries. Of course. Dude, I just want like if if, if, if only right there, dude. Like you pick Kennen, which by the way in the modern day, that's a, a champion you do for the team fight to help the team. Yep. This motherfucker just builds it as a carry. Like, yeah. He's such a ridiculous human being, isn't he? The fact everyone just keeps paying him millions every year. Like to be fair, think about it. It's like when someone's like a young rapper and they get into like criminal problems. Well, what did you expect? He's just a young kid who's not anything about the world, and you're just tossing money at him all the time and telling him like you're the best. Everything you do is right. It's like, yeah, he's gonna make bad decisions then. Like, what Hooney has no feedback because his feedback is like, oh, you got benched, Hooney. Oh, fuck, what, what's the punishment, boss? Because he's Korean, right? And then they go, new contract, more money. It's like, oh well, yeah, yeah. This uh fucking running it down thing pays well. Like, what is this shit? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the I thing you said is also insane. When he went to, when he went to Academy and straight up trolled. <laughs> I'm not talking like inted like he's bad. He was trolling. He trolled, so they rewarded him by making him the starter on a better team. What? Yeah, maybe he'll maybe he'll what try an LCS. <laughs> Dude. This guy, like, if, if if everyone else out there is, like, unlucky and they're getting cursed monkey paws, he's like the Sauron of monkey paws who made all the monkey paws. And when you all do your wishes, it grants him wishes. Like, this motherfucker has, like, infinite lives. What is this shit? Is this just, is the whole world just Hooney's world and we're living in it? I don't know what's going on right now. I thought he was just a player. It's the strength of getting to that world finals, man. You get to the world finals, <laughs> you're, you're chilling. Not semis. Semis. Well, no, he got to the finals. The, the evil genius. With the SKT. Man was on clutch gaming too so. oh you're right no you're right yeah i forgot about that i totally deleted that from my memory yep. yeah because i remember just faker doing it also <laughs> you're right he was technically on that team dom yeah what, what was the point you were going with before we went into Hooney's accolades <laughs> I, I was just talking about like the evil genius management was the clutch gaming management before yep. so they probably oh, right, saw yes. a lot of what who needed on clutch and they just wanted him to do the same thing on evil geniuses so. yeah I mean, that, that makes sense. I mean, at least there is like some reasoning for it. Like at least they've seen the light. You know, I thought it was just like, I, I well, I mean, I knew that it was Artemis and stuff like that, but I just didn't know like how many other people were there to actually yeah. facilitate that that decision. Still think, still think it's it's fucking crazy that this guy like literally got paid like 600k in a split. He he got paid more than Demonte's got paid for the last <laughs> three years probably to just int a fucking split and then he just goes like to another team and is just starting again like that is just crazy to me Demonte goes to fucking worlds and can't get a spot over Ika and Ryoma and Huni's just running it down and then just like takes Kumo's spot after they get yeah. third in spring that is just fucking nuts I mean my issue with the whole thing as well is like I've always said this 
I don't go the other way. Like, I'm also consistent on Hooney. When Hooney has, like, really good times, I've always praised him as a good player. Like, in LCS, he's always been, like, above average. Like, let's be real. Like, he's never been a bad player. The problem is, though, he's an example of a player where you can't just judge him as a player because everyone knows he's always getting the monster contract. So it's like in sports. If you have, like, a max contract in the NBA, you can't be the second best player on your team or you can't just, like, half the game shit the bed. Like, you're the star player. That's what the contract says. So I think part of the reason he gets the flame is, like, Whenever he has these times where he looks at, he just doesn't give a fuck. Everyone knows he's like one of the highest paid players in the entire league. So like that's going to like naturally when you accept those contracts, that's just the territory that comes with it. Like you, I won't say you deserve it because I don't know if anyone deserves to be flamed all the time, except reckless and whatever, all the ones I do, but no, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do it at least in my way. So whatever, not, not on Twitter. Except on Twitter, but just not adding them. Whatever. I've got my own rules. That's the point. <laughs> but I mean, the thing is, like, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about when you're talking about Hoodie, right? The, the two people that you're going to compare Dude, him to. He may have met, let's be real. Uh, like, let, let's have a guess for a second, right? Just as a fun guess, Dom. If you had to guess how much in pure raw salary Hoonie has made in his career. It's probably like what four million dollars or something, right? Yeah, probably up there, close. Like we're not joking. It's probably it's probably more, by the way, in like combined salary and prize money than like Expecke, record any of those guys probably ever had in their whole career. Oh yeah, I mean, especially because like if you think about the the years where he came over, like I'm not sure what his Immortals contract was, but when he joined, it must Echo, have been huge though, because everyone said they like inflated the market. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, if you're if you're leaving Fnatic, which was a top four team in the world at the time, and like. Your 18 owing splits in Europe to come to NA with, with Raider. They got a fat fucking, they got a bag for that. And then, yes, w starting with, with, uh, with Echo Fox days, I mean, that was e Echo Fox days was when he first got like the, the rumored $800,000 contract. And then it just theoretically just went up from there. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at Dude, I I've realized, though, that's also why he gets the contract, isn't it? Because if you think about it, he nearly always joins the orgs that are the newer orgs. Like, he joined, like, Echo Fox, Immortals, Clutch. fucking Clutch, EG. So he, he really is the guy where, like, the joke is this. Like, whoever the new owner of all these teams is, is sat there with the big cigar, like, in the room. And then he goes... Bring me that Hooney guy I saw a while ago when I was watching LCS. And like, sir, he hasn't been good for I said, bring me Hooney. And then they just bring him in like, sign him to the highest contract. There we go. So <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, the two people you have to compare him to that are getting like bags to play here, Impact and Someday, right? So if you look okay. at Impact and Someday, right? Like those- But you're going to throw a frog in on that one. Because to be fair, it would be totally justified if you also yeah. put him in. He's, all, he's probably made like, what? Set a 10 times the amount as a bad version of himself that he did when he was the best player. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. There's another one too. There's like Power People is in the same boat as well. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, uh, PoE is uh, high, but I'm talking about for like just Korean top laners. Like Korean top oh, laners, yeah. they oh, got right. like huge amounts of money to play here, Impact and Someday. And like you yes. look at those guys' performance and Impact, like he's had one bad split, which was the, the last one um, in the whole time that he's been here. Besides for that, he's always been one of the, the best, like top three top laner um, at minimum, if not the best for a while and then someday who's literally on the worst fucking team that you could yep. be on like he has to play dude he has to play with ryoma like i know i flame ryoma and by but the way one thing you've got to say about these two guys that is mad respectable they never give up they yep. always play properly like true Absolutely. fools i have mad respect for those guys because remember they've they've been in korea and being champions dude one of them's been a world champion mm -hmm. that would be the most understandable guy to go you know what at this point in my career on a bad team i'm just gonna mail this one in they never do it these guys actually mm -hmm. play as though it was life and death when you're like as you're saying with like, the ninth best team in lcs yeah no i, th I think respect. That, that that's the the biggest thing about someday is like i don't know how he's still not lost his mind from being in na he's never been on a good team the only split he ever had that he was on a decent team was like the first split when he was on the team that got to finals and they just got 3-0 swept but i mean i guess somehow Mate, they got he, there. he even went to academy and kept playing seriously and won academy this guy is just a fucking g <laughs> Yeah. This guy is amazing. He's actually yeah. just, like that's a role model, kids. Like that guy actually does does his job. Yeah, he gets paid and he does his job. Even if you watch like the heist and stuff, like he's there, like trying to like he's actually participating in like the team discussions and stuff. And you know that that just if you've played with Korean players, you know how much they hate that shit. If if you're like guys, this is what we're going to do. Instead of playing the game, we're going to have this like psychological talk and we're going to talk about like, you know, what our <laughs> motivators are. And like, you know, imagine Demontis played with Pig. Imagine Piglet go, waking up and then sitting in that conversation where it's like, Piglet, uh, what what do you want to, to, to do today? Like, what are your biggest motivators for the day? And he's like, I want to I want to smoke cigarettes and play League. Shut the fuck up. Like, someone tells Piglet to go do yoga and then he just walks away and smokes his cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's so fucking crazy to me. And you see, like, someday trying to actually participate in the team discussion. Like, you know, like, I, I think that today, you know, my focus will be on, like, TP timers and things like that. Like, you know that that shit just is, like, so far below what 
what Koreans normally think it, about it's the actually, game. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why, like, it's, as, unfortunately, it's a bad news if you're a Western fan, but the, the players that everyone loves, so they loved Piglet because he was kind of like the Korean double lift, right? He was willing to trash talk and BBM. They love Hooney because he's got personality. They've even loved players like GBM. Well, unfortunately, if you notice, the players that mail it in and fuck around are the ones that when they go to the West, they're Koreans, but they were already like a Westerner in some sense. Because if people don't know, that's it's way more famous actually to be like the someday or the impact guy. Like I know in StarCraft, it's really depressing, by the way. If StarCraft used to be the biggest game in esports, there are players to this day who are Korean StarCraft players who you wouldn't even know who were playing for like a tiny team in some like European country or Chinese team that you've never heard of team and they play a and pra- do they practice as though they're one day going to get to the very top and they're never like they're never going to do it but they play as though the dream is still there because that's just like the mad work i think those guys come with like their whole philosophy is that you solve problems by working hard yeah i mean it's 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 the whole korean philosophy where it's like the more hours you put in like if you put in two more hours than the next guy you're going to be that much better you're going to be two hours better than him you stack that up every fucking day like that's how you're just going to like become a champion and they're going to be nothing so like those types of players like that is just a korean mindset it's like you just have to outwork your, your opponents and i love seeing that from because like if you've played na solo queue impact is always high rated someday is always like bouncing around the high ratings and he recently hit rank one before playoffs so like these guys are actually fucking putting in their 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 own dude i don't know when the last time i fucking saw hooney was in solo queue you play solo queue when do you see hooney in solo queue man like this guy just doesn't play like, oh i actually actually this this season is the first season hooney has actually taken solo queue serious in na the wait, entire time he's been here what which, which, what, what account that, is he on that's strong let me up. It's, no eg hill like his last name like right yeah. now he's a thousand sixty four okay. lp i've Holy never seen shit. him yeah no, it's insane. I, I messaged him the other day. I was like, wow, bro, you're actually playing solo queue. I think on Echo Fox, there was a time when I I looked at all of his OPGDs and his accounts. He had less games played than days in the year. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit, man. Like, this is actually yeah. a pro player. One of the highest paid players the LCS region's ever produced. Dude, I, I just remember, like, in season six, Hootie was just, like, tweeting out. You, if you followed him on Twitter, it's like, hey, by the way, like, that was when Overwatch came out in, in season six. And he would just be, like, tweeting out, like, just hit, like, 77 rating, which, like, which at the time, like, was like, yeah, that puts me in, like, the top, like, 0.5 or, like, 0.005% of players. Like, it's, like, higher than Challenger in NA. I'm like, wait, like... You gonna play League at all, or what? You just going pro in Overwatch? It's like, yeah, no, nah, like I'm just gonna be a god at every game. Like, fuck this shit. Which was respectful for me because at least at the time he was still performing. So like for me, it was kind of like a meme. It was like, damn, this guy is yeah. so good. He's just by far the best, and he's playing fucking Overwatch, and he's gonna be the best at that too. Like I just had so much respect. But then like, yeah, I mean, when it, when it became this, it's like, okay, when when you start into on stage, maybe you gotta put in some more hours. You know, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, but. I mean, I think we've beaten the 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 Hooney topic to that. <laughs> the other player I want to talk about that we mentioned briefly here was your experience playing with Piglet. Um, I know that this guy, like, <laughs> I know you laugh. Okay, you laugh instantly, so I I expect uh, to, to get some juice out of this. But um, yeah, I mean, this is guy is like former world champion, had a huge storied career. You played with him in clutch in spring. Um, yeah. and, and then you guys got even nine. replaced. Even got replaced by him eventually. He's yeah, a fucking yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, how was it? Because like, I mean, my experience playing with Piglet was like this guy like would just not talk in scrims. Like if if like things would go wrong, he'd be like mute. You know, like wouldn't really want to do team discussions. Kind of like would lose faith in certain teammates and just not like talk to them anymore. Really, how, how did you feel playing with him? Like, did any of this stuff ever get better in NA or? Yeah, what nah, <laughs> no, it's just like, it was the same kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> okay. if, if the game went wrong, he would just mute or like, he would just go on his phone and vaude view or something and it would just be like, okay, I guess this is fine. And then I don't like, like, just like random stuff like that. But if there's like one thing about Piglet, it was like, if he was in control of the game and we were going into like a team fight or something, I knew for sure we would win. This guy was just so insane at the game. Mm-hmm. But it's just like everything outside of the game was just not there for him. But like I've never seen such a like insane team fighter mechanics, just stuff like that. He is so crazy. Yeah, no, he that's was really the good. area I I feel like is always misunderstood about these guys. Like right? when they all get labeled as toxic, because like Forgiven's a good example. I would even say in terms of playing style, people think the same about Frog and that he was very selfish as a player. He just wanted his lead. The reason why they do it though makes sense. At one point in time, they were all like not only the best player on their team, but sometimes the best in their region, and they were always have the lead. So their logic was what the logic probably should be. Like whoever has the lead is one of the carries in the game probably should have some of the like direction of what happens in the game. Because what you're saying is I've got a lead. Here's how we can use it to win the game. So the problem is those guys, I think just get like addicted to that though. 
And eventually, one day, they're not the best player. They're not even the guy with the carry in the game. But they're still trying to play as though, like, if you play through me, we win the game. Because as you say, like, even when he was in clutch, he would still have some games where he would just carry the whole fucking game. It's just it wasn't every game like he thought it was, seemingly. And eventually, unfortunately, where that does become toxic, in my opinion, is when they sort of, like, instead of recognizing, like, I don't carry anymore, they flip it and they're like, oh, it's because you didn't do everything I said that I couldn't count. Like, that's when it becomes toxic, where you just blame everyone else, basically. It can't always be your teammates' fault. Yeah. I mean, one thing I right. wanted... I, well, before you go into your point, I just wanted to ask this question. You, you, This was the split where he actually did play mid. Like, did he play some mid over you at some point? It was like week nine he played mid. Okay. When we were already out, we were already out of playoffs, so there was no like, there was no hope. I don't know. They just like put him mid for some reason. I don't know. He played like a really or something. I think. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, no, he was like playing Rise or something. He just like he kind of okay. got dumpstered. It was like really weird. How 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 was that when when you just got the news? It's like by the way, uh, you're getting replaced by Piglet mid lane. <laughs> like, did you think? I I don't know, dude. I was just like, okay, I guess Piglet just runs the team or something. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Holy fuck! All right. What were you gonna say before I uh, just I, injected that? <laughs> It was just something around that time, or around that like same idea. It's just like, now that I'm not playing with any Korean imports, it's like a lot nicer. <laughs> I don't know. It's like they they kind of the when I when I played with the Korean imports, I feel like they just controlled the team so much. Whereas like I wasn't able to do, I, I didn't have my own uh, say. Sometimes it was kind of just like I was their, I was their pawn. I don't know. Maybe it's oh, you I'm can not, say it, dude. Like, you were their bitch. Yeah, sure. I mean, like... yeah, sure. I mean. I don't know, it just feels like I have, maybe it was because I was a rookie too. They just kind of expected me to be like that. But it was just like, they kind of ran the team, I felt. It was just interesting. I mean, yeah. what you're saying is a real factor. Like, remember in Korea, age is literally a metric yeah. by which you, you decide who gets to say So as weird as it might seem to a Westerner, especially in your case, like in your case, the argument would be like, but dude, I'm the mid laner. Like, I should obviously have say. Like, But to them, they would think like, well, I'm the veteran. I'm older than you. I've done more than you in my career. And also I'm Korean, so I know Korean mackerel. So I'm sure they had like a million reasons why yeah. they just thought you were just some fucking like like stunt dummy or something in mid lane. Like, whereas you're actually like, dude, I'm like one of the better players. It was like one of the biggest issues between me and like Piglet for sure, where I just like, I feel like I never could get heard. And it took me so long to realize that I might as well just not argue with him because it's never going to go anywhere. I don't know. I feel like a, a lot of players have similar experiences with that. Yeah. I, I mean, it's crazy that you could have like the two different, um, the two different mindsets, right? Because the person we just talked about before is like someday who's like, yeah, Tommy, you get all the counter picks. I am B1 Renekton every <laughs> single game. <laughs> and then you just see him like play, play fucking Renekton. Like you're, you're watching him just like try to clear the side lane. Tommy walks past, misses two skill shots on the cannon or on the fucking super minion, just goes back to mid lane. It's like, yep, this is fine. Like, how do you actually not lose your mind when you're in that fucking. <laughs> position man. And dude just... you know you know what my dream is i heard that clip actually Holy today shit. dom because since i subscribed to that like clips channel you have now obviously the youtube algorithms just fucked me so just recommended me all your videos right but i saw that one you did where it was like a one minute clip where you had featherman on your stream mm -hmm. by the way i told everyone he's one of the best personalities if you get him going oh. basically and oh, he has it. that hilarious little rant he does which he's obviously half trolling yes. where he just says like you know like 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 what fucking pro player could even calculate, you know, like the damage like the items would do and stuff. Like I'm not a fucking nerd, but then he says the line <laughs> straight fire. He says like, plus like, why would I learn all that shit? I'm already a pro. It's like, yeah. the reason that's genius is I want Hooney to do his own version of that where it's like, well, why would I learn the matchups and like what to do in the game? I already, I've already got the job. It's like, because <laughs> what's fucked is there's almost a logic to that there actually almost is a logic it's not quite it's trolling but yeah. there's almost a logic to it it's funny put that way you, you know what, what the best is about those types of clips is just seeing like reddit's reaction because like people get so they're like what the fuck this guy doesn't care about items like he doesn't care about math <laughs> fuck this guy money, like, they get so mad working. for no reason it's like Dude, have you ever interacted with another human being in your entire fucking life? <laughs> like, can you not tell sarcasm when somebody's like joking? Like, yes, dude, yes, he actually doesn't care about item builds. He also doesn't want to win either. Yes, he, he doesn't give a fuck because he's already a pro. That's what he that's that's what he is literally saying, so that's what he means, right? There's no chance that he could be sarcastic in any way. Maybe he's being a little bit facetious. Nope. People just take that shit like 100% serious and you see the conversation on Reddit. It's like, yeah, well, this is why Misfits isn't in playoffs it's like because of this guy. It's like, come on, man. Like he was one of the better players on this team. So I, I don't really know, man. I just find it so funny to like upload clips like that and just like kind of weed out the idiots closely. It's like, oh, you thought this was serious? Well, you're dumb. Like, and I can just like tag Maybe them, you know? Meanwhile, if Bjergsen did that, they'd be like, oh, wow, Bjergsen's such a cool guy, you know, doesn't stress about the little things, keeps his eye on the prize, you know, <laughs> tries to just play cool, calm, and collect. I've always loved Bjergsen. Great personality, yeah. Hilarious yeah. guy as well, opens up with the fans, like... 
Yeah, it's like, could right, you, guys. can you fucking blame Bjergsen anyway? I mean, he has to play with fucking speaker. What, item, what, what do <laughs> items matter, that. matter at this point as well? Like, there'd always be another angle, so. I Just imagine, like, Bjergsen, you have to play your team with double lift in your bot lane. What a blower. Yeah, this exactly. Like... It's like, double lift, double <laughs> still thinks he's in fucking season seven, like, winning MVPs or some shit. Like, I don't know, man. I think that those, those clips are just so funny because... If you can't even get past the idea of, of the fact that it's sarcasm there, like, I can't even argue with you about the game. Like you, The, the guy was even laughing as he was saying it. And Brad, like, like, if you know his voice, you can always tell by his voice when he's, like, just trolling, basically, because he has that, like, ridiculous... It sort of gets a bit higher. So yeah. you can just tell he was joking. Come on. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just loved it. But uh, <laughs> I, think the, I think the thing there that, that's that's, you know, I think valuable is um, just, like, how the items actually differentiate from each other because... Even though people like meme the whole Morello's Leandres thing, like it's kind of gone the other way where people don't actually know when Morello's is viable. And yes. you look you look in LPL and they build Morello's every, every fucking game. game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> every single game in LPL is, is Morello's. But like I think that that's a little bit too far where it's like only good sometimes, but there is like a value of that item with the pen, which is like the whole joke that that you know, people have kind of like misconstrued is like, yeah, if you ever build Morello's instead of Leandres, they immediately look at like like the healing and it's like well it needs to be like an immense amount of healing like every other champion needs to have healing or it's or it's worthless where i, I don't feel like it's that much uh it's it's not what like it, what what does demonte think about this as a general topic because obviously there's a lot you can go on there like forget, it doesn't have to just be morello and leandry's but if you've got a thought on that but i, I want to know like in terms of the idea of like do you calculate your builds and do, i don't know i know power of evil by the way does some weird builds he actually does do it he really does run the numbers he just puts them on twitter even so do you care about that shit do you look into it or do you just do what, whatever the most popular builds how do you do your things I feel like for me, it's a lot of feel. Like if, if I'm interested about the numbers, I'll message like an analyst or something and be like, yo, can you figure out how much like damage like Predator does for me versus, or like Dark Harvest versus Lex Hughes, like something like I used to think about a lot. But for me, it's a lot of feel, I think, especially with like the three Lost Chapter items in the mid lane for the AP characters. It's like, you have like Archangels, which is really scaling. You have the Sprinkler item, the GLP, which is like really good for early game. And then you have Ludens, which is just like pure damage. But for me, it's just like a lot of feel. I don't really like, I don't really sit there and crunch the numbers. I, like, what am I, a nerd? No, it's, it's Yeah, like, exactly. It's like, I don't exactly. know. I just, you're fucking Tanner from high school. <laughs> like, you have the nerds do that shit for you. If your analyst doesn't do it, you shove them in a locker. I love that approach, you know? Yep, exactly. <laughs> Is there any is there any like weird thing that you or is there any build that you like super prefer? Like we know that that Power Evil runs like the Lich Bane Oriana, like that's like his thing, you know. The Nashos Tooth Oriana, like those types of things. Is there any like type of build that you just really really have like a preference for for some reason that you can think of? Like any type of champion uh, uh, they play. <laughs> the 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 ward clearing AD item that thing is OP. Oh, Umbral Glaive. I, I forgot, yeah, Umbral Glaive. Like if I can never build that item, I'm just building it instantly. Okay, true, true. Did you build it uh, in your so Jace game this split? You played Jace. I like, I, first I, yeah, I don't. I, I don't think so. I don't think oh, I did. Okay. All right. The thing is, for a mid laner, as long as you can make it work, like I'd imagine it is sick just being able to clear the ward for free. And, and yeah, to I mean, be fair, like it has the effect, so it'll go through armor and shit. Like it's not like it does nothing. It even has a decent amount of AD. Yeah, I think it's pretty pretty OP for sure. I mean, you see like Ignar playing Pantheon support literally just because this item is a thing. Yeah, I mean the thing is like. I don't know, man. Like it, we see Pantheon support in other regions, it just looks different when Ignar's playing it. Like when Kaiser plays it, like when Kaiser plays it or Karia plays it, like these types of players. Or uh, I think it was Barrel that actually brought it out first in, in LCK. But the, the whole point is like these players like fit it in and they play like it much differently than Ignar, where it, it looks like they're you know like for, even just from runes, right? Like they're taking PTA. They're like, all right, it's all about like early game and stuff like that. And then you have Ignar playing like Conquer Pantheon. He's playing for the fucking team fight. Like he's like, no, I'm gonna scale. I'm gonna carry this goddamn team. So, I, I just feel like it's so weird seeing that pick uh, come into the meta. Um, he's another player. He's another Korean import. I predict is gonna stay in NA for years and years, be in different teams every season. He's just gonna keep getting hired. St do the same exact playing style every fucking year. Get mad paid, and then just like most of them, when he has his good game, everyone's just gonna praise him. So the cycle will just continue. Yeah. And, then, and you know what? I used to actually think it was a bad thing that Riot did the import slots. I realized now it would just be like LCK 2014. It would be like <laughs> LTS 2020 if you hadn't have fucking done that. Like I was wrong on that one, Riot. You were sort of like. In some ways, you would have ruined the league. It would make the league maybe more competitive. I don't know, but like you, it would have. You would have had just too many like washed up Koreans. I think. Yeah, we'd have Mickey. We'd have Mickey and NA starting. We would never Monday. leave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, 
I mean, thank God for, for, for DeMonte that we have that roller. It would just be doomed. Fly, Fly would still be here. Yeah, Fly would still be. And that was the other one I was going to go to. <laughs> Dude, that's the wildest, isn't it? Is when The wildest one ever to me is where people like Fly are playing for like challenger teams in NA and then they go back to Korea and they're like starters on like a real RCK team. And you're like, what? What? This was an option? Like the maddest one, I'll never get over this ever, DeMonte, is that like fucking Dandy like failed to qualify for <laughs> LCS. Like, dude, that, yep. that guy was a god to me. That was like, I thought he was the greatest jungler ever. Like, at, at that point in time, like, I normally usually say, like, it doesn't ruin your career if you keep playing as long as you want, you know. But in a, in a way, it sort of does on that one. Like, that hurts to just know that he didn't even make it. Like, yeah. He came with someone else, too. It was like Dandy and... Uh... My, was it the uh, United team? Mad Life, I think, wasn't it? No, was it Mad Life? No. Uh, he was on Licorice's was... team, though, I'm pretty sure, right? I think it was Dan yeah. Danny played with... Um... GBM, maybe? Oh, was yeah. It? Maybe it was. I think it was GBM. Was it GBM? I Holy think they might have played together. That, that's just crazy to me. Yeah, oh, yeah it was GBM. Yeah, also, also GBM... GBM when he was like playing on the teams, he was like completely washed in my mind. He was merely in like a motherfucker, man. <laughs> yeah, that that guy was uh not very good. I mean, one one thing we we, we got to talk about for sure is the playoff picture, right? Um, yes. So you guys obviously qualified. You guys are, are are you guys qualified for winner bracket um semis? So it's you guys versus Team Liquid, and then it's FlyQuest versus C9. Do you have like any predictions going forward? Like in your mind, I mean, I'm sure you're super confident in Golden Guardians. Like, who do you think is going to make it um, going in? Do you think Cloud9 is going to actually pull their shit together and be really strong? Like, do you have any opinions on uh, the playoff picture, how it shapes up? Yeah, I think C9 will probably 3 0 FlyQuest, if I'm being honest. I don't think. Damn. I, th I think FlyQuest going five games with Evil Geniuses was like a really bad look. It wasn't a good look. Yeah. FlyQuest. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't think Evil Geniuses are that far from the pack. They're not, like, super, like, way worse than everyone else. But, like, I didn't think that they were the similar level as FlyQuest. And, I don't know, just, like, from scrims and stuff, too, FlyQuest are kind of looking like they're on, like, a downswing maybe a little bit. And then, I don't know, I, I think C9 is, are going to get their stuff together, too, just yeah. from scrims. They're, like, I feel like they're back in this mode where it's just, like, unbeatable, yeah. if I'm being honest. Okay. And uh, for us against Team Liquid... I don't really know how it's gonna go. I think Team Liquid they look they look good, they look solid, but I feel I feel like if if we keep playing at our level, then it's gonna be a really close series. But would you, you know, rather thought, would you rather play against Team Liquid than FlyQuest? Or then uh, then, then C9? Yeah, my bad. Yeah, yeah, I th I would rather play versus Team Liquid for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Dude, your boy calls this better do work in this series. He better do work. We've He's seen got no it before. excuse. We've seen it before, right? Like yeah, uh, I think we've got a chance. Yeah, he, he he did work the game. The first game you guys played were obviously like they were, they ended up like winning off like some random team fight with Mordekaiser like ulting you or something. But I got picked. Yeah, <laughs> I mean uh, overall you guys were in control for most of the game and closer absolutely demolished Broxen that game. Like Broxen was literally getting killed or getting his flash burn on cooldown whenever he stepped into his own jungle. So I thought that that game like was a good indication of what could happen in uh, the close servers Broxen matchup. But those champions are like still in the meta, right? Like we're going to see a lot of graves, a lot of uh, a lot of Nidalee. So I definitely think that there's options for for closer to destroy him. Um, on the C9 versus FlyQuest thing, one thing that I just wanted to like mention is just the matchup has been so heavily C9 favored. Like I think C9 is something like I think there's they're, they're um, seven and zero. Oh. I think they've only oh, ever wow. lost some like it wasn't just that one playoff game that they lost I don't, they didn't in, lose like, a in the finals. Game. No. Did they not lose in spring at all? I they I think they might be seven and oh. They they I don't know, I don't think they've ever lost this lineup plan, yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um <laughs> God, I, Closer just joined the chat, and the, this guy, I don't know if you've seen uh, his Twitter, DeMonte, but this guy just permanently just, harasses me on Twitter. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't he's know actually bullying you. He's actually bullying me hard, but whatever, you know, we take <laughs> it. At this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the elders, so I probably deserve it. Like, you know, it's... <laughs> It just happens. Uh, if you know something spicy, by the way, right? I can't tell because unfortunately they don't list this stuff on Gamepedia. But if, and I know a lot of League of Legends fans, unfortunately, don't know the way Double a Limb works because it barely exists in League of Legends. But usually what you do in Double a Limb is you actually flip which side you drop down to the bracket in the second round of the lower bracket. So in theory, right, on the upper bracket now, like the reason why you do that is so you don't just play the same person you played in the upper bracket. So as far as I know, if they do that, if it, say Golden Guardians lost, they wouldn't actually go and play TSM now. I think I thought, I thought the they did play the TSM. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the bracket is really weird. So if we lose, we that's play even TSM weirder again. then. You yeah. play them immediately. Yeah, that's normally why that rule exists to make it so that you don't just like yeah. instantly lose it. Because the reason I was going to say that is that in that case I'm wrong. Because I was going to say if that was true, then the earliest you could ever play TSM again would be the spicy like decider game for basically. Worlds. Yeah. almost decided for Worlds. So like that, it's too bad that's not the case because that would be a fucking awesome game. Because yeah, one I, thing I, I want to see since they're in the lower bracket is 
Dude, I know they're in the low bracket, so everyone thinks, well, they're going to make it past all these like lower teams. Dude, the pressure on TSM now is going to be enormous. Mm -hmm. Enormous. Like, there is, like for some of them, it's not as bad as Dobbleth, where you say like, it's, it saved his career to have a lower bracket. But like, it is going to be massive yeah, yeah. pressure. Sorry, your he didn't say that. He said, he said it potentially definitely saved my career where i just like i see that fucking i'm like you gotta pick one motherfucker like you can't you can't just be saying both of those it's like yeah no i think that potentially definitely demonte was one of the best guests on the crackdown it's like what the fuck does that even mean like like these are such non-quotes that i just i, I can't stand it when i watch those types of interviews but. also come on man like double lift if you're gonna do those interviews and say that you're really hungry you're gonna make team liquid regret kicking you out so you gotta deliver after that mate like at this point in time when you say you're really hungry we think of a guy sitting down at a big feast ready to eat now i see you I, I, maybe you meant you were like a fucking starving african kid or something like what the fuck do you what are you talking about this trash talk's garbage you just yeah. trash talk to yourself from the past <laughs> yeah i mean we'll have to see uh do you guys think you just have huge mental edge if you do end up dropping down and playing tsm like how confident are you gonna feel in that uh best of five if it does happen i mean i think i will definitely have an edge for sure since we 3 0 them and like the fashion that we did i don't know i i, I feel like I don't know, like, like Golden Guardians have a lot of young players, I feel. So I'm just, I've been like making sure they don't get too excited a, a lot. So I'll try to like come in with like a level head, if I'm being honest. Because even, Wait, even when we won that like, game two. I mean, you guys... Wait, he thinks he's like the OG now already. He's already Wait. been in the league for like two Wait, years. I'm like, like thinking about it. It's I like, like young buck. It's, it's like your you, OG. Yeah. You, you've got... Um, settle down. <laughs> I've done this before. Listen, <laughs> no. I've been a Worlds, man. I've played Faker, you know. Like, right. FBI, we yeah, I went to down, man. Listen, FBI, what's this your... What's this your first time beating TSM in a fucking series? Act like you're supposed to be here, kid. <laughs> no, I'm not, all I'm saying is like when we were winning the game two with the back door, we yeah. were just like everyone was freaking out. I was like, guys, I got reverse swept last year. Please don't make oh, this right. happen again. Like, <laughs> sure. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I just when I see that team, though, I mean, like you got fucking Hanser who's been playing forever, a and you have Huhi for at this point has been playing forever as well. So like, do it's you guys, swap though? Do you actually feel like, like you're one of the veterans? Sort of. I mean, in, in a way, like. I don't know. We get really excited when we win, you know? It's, like, uh, it's really refreshing. I, I love it a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. But, I'm like, also, I'm, like, they're trying to make sure we don't get too excited. Who, who gets hyped on your team? Like, you guys don't even seem like you'd have a very hyped team. Like, maybe closer, I could see it. But, like, it's FBI getting super hyped. That guy seems, like, very, like, even -keeled. Australians are usually pretty chill. That's normally the vibe it, that it, everyone gets from them, you know? It's, like, close, closer and Victor. Like, FBI get really hyped. Oh, I mean, man. I get hyped, too. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm, like, trying to make sure... I, I try to make them get hype, you know, because I think it's important. But I just yeah. like, you have to stay level headed, especially in a best of five. Mm -hmm. I sure. could totally believe Closer goes ham, by the way, because Turkish people, especially, are like mad emotional. Like, like, I live in Amsterdam, right? And we have an area where there's loads of like Turkish immigrants who live there. And I'm not joking, when they're, when they're having like a local football game in like fucking Turkey or whatever, dude, when you go by there, like the Turkish flags and people beeping the hall, like, you know, basically, if they won the game or not, just by that one fucking area, like, I just stay away from there. <laughs> 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 Why do you stay away, what man? I, like, what the fuck? I'm not a fan of their team. I don't want to fucking go out and have an argument about fucking Turkish football. I just, I just stay in my own fucking corner. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm doing esports, motherfucker. It's like, don't, don't, don't <laughs> yeah. fuck with me. Like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like, like that team, it would just be like, I feel like you'd be like the one getting the most hyped, like knowing your team. Like if I looked at your team, I would just yeah. What I, are you like? It's Tana Tap, bitch. Like <laughs> yeah. throwing up fucking, I don't know, some sort of symbols or some shit. <laughs> I got, I got the pregame hype, but not the postgame. Right. You know? Okay. Wait, what? So you guys, so wait, you're hype before the game, and then you guys play the game, and you're like, ah, whatever. Like, yeah. You're like I'm over that, it. That's, that's science right there. You gotta hype them up before the game, get the adrenaline pumping, and then bring it down. You know, play the game. What the fuck? That, that must yeah. feel super, super depressing for them because, like, you go into the game, they're all nervous, and then this guy's just fucking super hyped next to you, and then you win, you're like, I did it, Tanner, I did it, buddy, and then you're like, shut the fuck up. Like, it's not clear. like that's so crazy. Like, Jesus. I respect it, though. It, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty aggressive. So, what, I, what I like as well is if you th if you listen to his answer there as well, he's not even doing it for a really good reason. Like he's not actually doing it, Dom, because you know you don't want people to get too excited. But he's actually doing it because he has trust issues because he got hurt that one time. He got reverse swept. So he's like, I'm never letting it happen again. I'm never gonna let myself believe I've won until I see that three zero. Like, yeah, uh, <laughs> man, I, I've been through a, a few of those reverse sweeps, even in like big fucking game. I mean, I got reverse swept on the series nine world. one. And then the Cloud9 oh, no. one for, that for was finals. Brutal, dude, dude oh. that, that one hurt, man. That, that, that was one. the brutal one. You should have been in the finals on that one, man. Yeah, whatever. Happens.
Yeah, when you're up 2-0 and you like you lose the third game, you're just like, oh fuck. Like, well, no. The thing, the thing was like the way that we lost that third game versus Cloud Nine is like super fucked with us because we had yep. like Juggernaut was like our comp yep. that we like if we ever got that comp versus like another team, we just stomped the fucking game. Like that was just like how we, we viewed it. So that loss is the most crushing because it's like we win our first two games just beating them standard, and it's like, all right, now they have to ban out our standard shit, and they just gave us Juggernaut in the third game. It's like, all right, well, this is just fucking free free win, and then we just. Somehow lose that game. Fourth game, we do pretty much the same thing. And we lost twice with our best comp. And then it's like, oh, man, going into that game five. It's like, guys, we can still do it. I believe. And you can tell that no one fucking believes. No, like, like, put, it, put it this way. That's, that, that's one of those examples of where if people don't know, that was the last split, like the classic Cloud9 lineup all played. So even though they made it to like semis, right? No, they made it to the final but, game second, obviously. Right? People obviously were like upset when they made the change. Like, oh, I don't know if you should have split them up. It's like, dude, the reason they got incarnation and just hold high, like, just time to retire, mate. It's because, like, they had no business being that final. So I think even they, like, somehow deep down knew, like, we fucking stole that yeah. one. We just, we nicked that one at the last minute. We should just be out. It, it was on. just, it was just the story of our team. They're like, our team was not actually a team. Like, we didn't fucking, like, talk to each other. There were communication issues. Like, no one fucking liked each other. We were just, like, we were the perfect amalgamation of, like, five players that were just, like, at the top of their roles at the time. And they just, like, stuck us all on a team. It's like, oh, you're doing well in LCS? Yeah. It's like, do you like these motherfuckers? Hell no. It's like, well, don't talk to them. <laughs> like, just, like, you do your shit. It's like, you win top lane, you win jungle, you win mid, you win AD care, you win support. Like, we just all try to win our positions, and hopefully that ends up being a victory. Like, there was no communication. There was no way where we could be like, hey, guys, like, how about we drop a wave and group early so that we get priority on this dragon in terms of vision? Hell no. Like, it's like, no, I'm going to be the strongest motherfucker in the game. Like, you can't get people to rotate. Like, it was crazy back then. That was that was the wild, wild west. But uh, we're in a different world now. So uh, before we jump topics, I mean, uh, if, if it wasn't Golden Guardians making that top three with, with TL and C9, which people are pretty much expecting to go to Worlds at this point, like, even if you beat TL, people are expecting they're just going to fucking run the lower bracket of and, and make it in, right? So what team do you think, outside of you guys, is the strongest out of, like, the FlyQuest EG TSM? Oh man, um, it's a tough one. Yeah, it, it is really tough. I think it's between FlyQuest and TSM. I don't think, like, I don't think Evil Geniuses are gonna win a best of five versus those teams. If I'm being honest, uh, I don't know. I think I would give it to FlyQuest. If I'm being honest, I think even with the, the way that they decline. Yeah, I don't know. I f I feel like TSM just. I I don't know. Maybe maybe the TSM FlyQuest matchup, if they end up playing, is gonna be like. Good for TSM, but I don't know. I feel like I feel like those two teams kind of play similarly, where their bot lanes are both struggling, and both their mid laners need to carry the game pretty bad. So it's, it would be kind of kind of hype matchup. I think I would give it to FlyQuest. I think yeah. like I think Solo plays really well. I think Santorin is like super consistent and always playing well too. And then Ignar is I don't know. I, I think Ignar is really really good. I think he is like a bit of a coin flip player, but like I think he's really insane. And the way that FlyQuest plays, they play like three three. They play 3v3 around mid lane all the time, and it's not something that most NA teams do. Yeah, it, it's weird because, like, FlyQuest is 2 over, over, uh, 2 up, or sorry, 2 0 over, uh, TSM in, uh, the regular season. Like, they won both games, so they, they've had historically a good matchup. I think they also were the team that eliminated, um, TSM that's, in. That's where the power of evil kryptonite thing comes from, yeah. Of course. Yeah, in spring. So they've, they've always matched up well, but I mean, <coughs> when you look at the teams, you expect TSM to have, like, yeah, the, the star power over them, right? Like, when you have double first wild turtle in the bot lane, like, that's supposed to be a double favored matchup, like, heavily. But that's why I said earlier, like, listen, he was definitely terrible in the Golden Guardian series. He wasn't the best AD carry in the split, but he wasn't, like, terrible over the whole split. Like, that's the thing about TSM. Because they have no identity as a team, it's only actually off player strength that they won all those games, in my opinion. Like, they won a lot of games in the regular split because they do have some good players. It's just they don't seem to actually have any, like, structure yeah. or identity. And, like, obviously, they have no jungler, basically. What do you actually think about that, by the way? Like, Devontae, am I hating on Spicker too much when I imply that, like, they have no jungler? Like, do, do you actually... Like, am I misreading something? Do you, does he do something in scrims or something? Because I'm amazed people just, like, don't even bring that up. When, like, I, I actually use that as a way to not blame the team that much. Like, I don't think they've got a very good constructed team, you know? I think in 2019, he looked like he didn't belong. But I think for this split, this summer split, he's just looked a lot better. I think he's kind of found his, like, footing playing, like, Lee Sin and, like, more of, like, the flashy champions. So I think okay. he's not, like... He's not a huge liability, but he's still not he's still not consistent in his play. Like even in our best of five, the first game he played pretty well, and in the second game he looked really bad. And I think it was the same exact matchup, I I, I believe. I think it was Lee versus set. And I don't know, he, he just doesn't have the yes. consistency yet. So I, I don't think he's like 
he's not why they win, but he's also not why they lose all the time. I would say. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just he—he he had too many like atrocious games during the split for me to like. Yeah, take like his... <laughs> Kane. <laughs> yeah, by the way, can we just go ahead and throw this out here, Dom? I can't believe we forgot this. If it depresses you when you see Gangplank locked in for Broken Blade, how about when fucking Nidalee gets locked in for Speaker? Like that third game draft was almost like the coaches were like, well, you know what? Based on our play, we're basically saying fuck the fans. Let's just sit with the draft. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm what's in... that draft? Uh, Wait, I, okay, that, that game though, it's like they picked set in Italy in mid-jungle, right? And then they didn't do anything together the whole game. So I, it's hard for me to just blame Spica. Yeah, like, I honestly. Mean, the thing is, like, they just lose every, I mean, they did the same draft versus Dignitas. They ended up winning the game because Dignitas is just so fucking awful that you win no matter what. <laughs> but, like, w when you when you look at their draft, you're drafting set in Italy versus Kane and Zoe, and you were literally getting 2v2 killed mid-jungle like you were getting both of you are dying killing the cane like that is so unreal to me that you pick set in italy and you die to cane level three like i just i can't see it so yeah. for, for me it's like that's just clearly not it for these for these guys like the sure i know that you know speak in theory is a really good nidalee player but you just need bjergsen to be on a fucking carry like he doesn't have the um he doesn't have the consistency or like the prowess to go into a game like as Nidalee and just take it take it over, which is different than than closer. Who I guess is technically a rookie. I know he played in Turkey, but technically closer is a rookie and, um, in this level of play. But you can just tell that closer understands how how to carry a game, right? Like when he's ahead, like he just starts running the game, like snowballing through dragons. He's getting every crab. Like it seems like he just understands like how to pace the game so that he's always ahead. And I just don't see that out of the other junglers. Like I don't he is though. Mate, even Closer can't win on Italy in LCS, though. That's the problem. Like, yeah, I'm just going to say this now. When, it, when everyone memes like that, right, the mistake they're making with the meme, where they're like the NA Jace, the NA in Italy, it used to be the NA fucking Rengar, obviously, right? The mistake people make is this. It's not the players. Like, for sure, these players can play that in solo queue. I bet they. I bet he dominates if he plays in Italy in solo queue. I bet even in the old region, they were probably good. But, like, I, I, I would guess, I don't know what it would be. I would just guess the teams don't play around them correctly, or they don't use, like, for example, I asked someone on another show about this the theory for like jace for example was like if you are like a monster top laner you play jace the idea is if you get the lead you just split push and you fucking carry the whole game but no one does that in any other you still just go and have a team fight so at that point maybe it wasn't worth doing like i think it's more like that because that's why i bring it up because like we can definitely meme on players for bad nidalee performances but that, that says it all if even closer can't win on it and he is like the pop-off jungler right now i don't think anyone in lcs is going to win on that champion mate yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see going into playoffs. But uh, yeah, Demonte actually has to get going here. Um, he has scrims, obviously. It's literally ton of time. Yeah. Fucking hell. <laughs> Interrupting our show and everything. Yeah, wow. it's, li it's literally it's fucking... Like, it's, I feel like TSM over here. I thought it was going to last longer. I thought we'd at least get a couple of hours out of it. Dem no, no, no. <laughs> fucking clicking for his zero and he's off. Yeah, right? yeah. Dem <laughs> Demonte just comes in, sweeps it, and then he's done. Like, I don't know. That, that's all you can get out of the guy. But yeah, no, they've got scrims um, and obviously big playoff match. Um, this weekend versus TL. So good luck to you in that one. Um, and yeah, that, that will be the end of the show. It's a good episode, episode 30. Apologize for all the internet disconnects and everything, but thank you for everyone that actually came and watched the show in the chat and appreciate uh, you being here, DeMonte, for this episode. Uh, we will see you guys next week. Peace, guys.